Hello everyone, welcome back to International Trade. I'm very excited today to finish our analysis of the Mendits model of heterogeneous firms. So recall the last time we uh, almost ended our analysis of our closed economy. So let us review a little bit the mechanics of the model. So the idea is that there is a, a pool of potential entrants each potential entrepreneur, right, has the possibility of paying a fixed cost of entry to discover its productivity phi. Then if the productivity is higher than a certain cutoff, the firm will make positive profits. And if the productivity is less than the cutoff, the firm will exit. So the market forces generate an allocation whereby the least productive firms are forced out of the market. And what is the equilibrium value of the cutoff, which determines everything, really? Well, that is determined by the zero expected profits. So the fact that the expected profits of paying the fixed cost of entry and discovering your productivity must equal the fixed cost of entry. Now, as we continue, uh, let us first look at the average profit equation. Okay, so uh, this is just to uh, further our understanding of this model. We saw before in the expected profit condition, what were the expected profits? Now we're gonna look at the average profits conditional on a firm being active. So how much money are the firms that are surviving that are active making? We're gonna denote that with pi bar A and that equals to the integral from the cutoff phi A to infinity of our profits, uh, where the, we're going to use the distribution of productivity conditional on being active. And so G is the PDF of the distribution divided by one minus capital G of phi A, that is the probability of being active, the probability of having a productivity higher than the cutoff. And so that PDF over the probability of being active, well, that is the conditional probability density function. Uh, perhaps you should uh, refresh your uh, knowledge of conditional distributions. All right, so we substitute the value of the profits. And so we have, you know, wage times FT times this function of phi and phi A. The integral, which is none other than our J function, and so substituting the expected profit condition, we obtain that the average profits of surviving firms equals the fixed cost of entry divided by the probability of being active. Okay. Now let's actually uh, take a second and examine a little bit more what this means. So I would like to um, just talk a little bit more about this uh, average profits just to further clarify how uh, the average profits and the expected profits that we saw in the equilibrium condition are related. So recall that, uh, so there is a cut of productivity phi A, what is the probability that uh, you're gonna uh, get a productivity below that phi A? So that probability of drawing a productivity below the cutoff uh, equals your CDF, G, capital G, evaluated at phi A. Right, so this is, this means that with probability G of phi A, you're gonna draw a productivity phi, which is less than the cutoff, and therefore you exit. And basically make uh, zero operating profits.
overall you make a loss because you still pay the fixed cost of entry. Right. You know, that's unlucky, but with probability, uh, with, the, with the probability one minus G of phi A, you're gonna draw a value of productivity higher than the cutoff. Hence, you will produce and make positive operating profits. And then perhaps you made the overall profits once you uh, subtract your fixed cost perhaps you still lost some money, okay? Perhaps you should never have uh, started your firm to begin with. Okay, but so how does this relate with the average profits? Well, uh, let's think about the expected profits first. So the expected profits that we saw before in the equilibrium condition were given basically by the probability of making zero profits, so G of phi A, times zero plus the probability of making positive profits times the average profits that you're gonna make. And in fact, we found that the average profits equals WFE over one minus G of phi A. So if we substitute this, if we substitute this expression into the expected profit formula, basically one minus G cancel out and you get that the expected profits equals to the fixed cost of entry. So I hope this uh, sheds a little bit more light on how this model works. And uh, uh, this is really the crucial uh, thing that it's important for this class, for this model. It is the finding of the cutoff, being able to understand that a bunch of firms will exit and a bunch of firms will survive and understand that there is a probability associated with being above or below the cutoff. Great. Now we can actually examine a little bit uh, what are the mass of firms, how many firms pay the fixed cost of entry, and how many firms are active. Now this is the only time really that we're going to look at this. There is a problem set in which you're asked to solve for this under a particular distributional assumption, but really for this class what matters for the merits model is uh, deriving the equilibrium value of the cutoff, because that's that's really all that matters, or the most thing, the most important thing is that. So, the mass of firms in autarky M A that produce equals the mass of entrants M E, the mass of firms that pay the fixed cost of entry, times the probability of surviving, times the probability that the uh, productivity cutoff is higher. Sorry, that the productivity you draw is higher than the cutoff. I mean, this, I guess, makes sense, right? So if there are 100 entrants and the probability of surviving is 70%, there are 70 surviving firms. Now, how do we uh, pin down these this two uh, mass of firms? Well, just like in the Krugman model, we were using the labor, uh, just like in the Krugman model, we were pinning down, we were finding the number of firms uh, by using the full employment condition. Here we're going to pin down the mass of firms, right? Because here we're thinking of a continuum of firms. So the number becomes the mass of firms using the same condition. Now, while in the Krugman model, the entrance and the firms that produce is the same thing, here we have a difference between the firms 
the potential firms, right, that have paid the fixed cost of entry and discovered their productivity, and the firms that actually survive. And so let's look at this in the full employment condition. So here what we have is a number of workers, L, that must be equal to the total labor requirements in the economy. So what we have here, well, we have some average variable and fixed cost of operation by active firms. This is LC, the output divided by phi. That is the total number of workers that a firm needs, right? Plus the, to produce the, you know, the variable proportion of its cost, plus the fixed cost of production, FD. This is the same as the Kruger model, right? Instead of one over phi, we had uh, beta. And instead of F, we had alpha. Right, so this, those are the cost of production. You integrate them over the active firms. So G over one minus capital G is the conditional distribution as we've seen before. So that is the average cost that active firms pay. There's NA active firms. So their product is the total number of workers needed to work in production. But then there is a labor requirement for the fixed entry cost, which is paid by all entrants and E. So you see here, this is the trade-off now. Not only you have to decide uh, how much to pay, uh, how, how many workers to assign uh, for the variable cost of production and the fixed cost of production within each firm and across all active firms, you also have to allocate workers between production and payment of the fixed cost of entry. Right? If you solve this equation, here is the algebra, you're welcome and I suggest you to look at it also for the problem sets. You see that the mass of entrance equals the number of workers L divided by this function of the two fixed costs. And I guess this makes sense. And the larger economy, if an economy with more workers will have more firms like in the Krugman model. And if the fixed costs are higher, you'll have fewer firms, a right? conditional on the cutoff. Okay, excellent. So this concludes our analysis of the closed economy of the Melitz model. I recall what's important here is the cutoff, okay? We've determined the cutoff and we've seen that the cutoff, changing the cutoff is gonna change the selection of firms and how much each surviving firm produces. And that's the most important thing in this model. Let's study now the effects of international trade. We're gonna model trade with uh, adding uh, to the model another country, which is gonna be identical to the home economy, kind of like the Krugman model. But uh, we're gonna make things a little more interesting. We're gonna think that first of all, there is a fixed cost of exporting. So if you sell domestically, you need to pay a fixed cost of production that captures all fixed cost of production, but also distribution. If you export, you also need a fixed cost of exporting. And perhaps is the fixed cost of production plus the uh, additional cost that you need to pay to, uh, I don't know, adjust your products to the, uh, you know, language, you know, the labels of your products to the language of the destination. Uh, perhaps you need to pass some uh, non-trade barriers such as regula regulatory barriers and so on. And so there is a fixed cost of export. And then there's also an extra uh, cost, which is going to be variable and is going to be denoted by tau. And this is an so-called iceberg trade cost, because it's basically saying that, you know, if you want to sell one unit of output abroad, you have to produce, you have to ship tau units of output. And tau minus one units melt away so that once this product reaches the destination, it started with tau units, it's now as, it now is at one. What this means, this is simply a multiplicative cost so that your costs are no longer the wage over your labor productivity when you export, but it's the wage divided by productivity times tau, okay? Excellent. So basically what we have to do now is repeat the algebra that we did uh, before, right? Before we look at the firm problem in the closed economy, 
Now that's still going to work, right? But now we have to repeat the same thing for the foreign economy. And so let's do that. Just kidding. Uh, we don't need to do the algebra again because it's pretty much the same thing, right? You're very welcome to try it out also because it will help you tremendously with remembering what is going on in the merits model. But these are the results. So uh, here we have the domestic variables on the second column and the export variable in the third column. See, domestic price is a constant markup over the marginal times the marginal cost. Right? And here we're normalizing wages to one. So we have one over phi. When we export, uh, the marginal cost increase to tau over phi. So this means that your export prices will be higher than your domestic prices. You can see here the expression for the individual consumption, which is very similar, but you know, since your price is higher because you have the trade cost, you consume less, everything else constant. Here we have the profits and you can see that the beauty of the maids model is that by using the cutoffs, we have these very symmetric expressions for domestic profits and export profits, and pi D and pi X. And finally, we have the productivity cutoffs domestic productivity cutoff and the foreign productivity cutoff. So let's study this a little more. If you take the ratio of the two cutoffs, what you get is this expression, which is a function of tau, fx, and fd. We're going to assume that this expression is greater than one. Now this kind of makes sense in the sense that if you assume that the fixed costs are the same, this boils down to saying that the differences in the cutoff is tau and tau is larger than one. And so this expression is larger than one. And you know, you even allow the fixed cost of exporting to be less than the domestic fixed cost. But all you require is that the product of tau to the sigma minus one times fx to be larger than ft. Why are we making this assumption? Well, let's see what this means for selection of firms. So from zero to phi D, the domestic productivity cutoff, firms are gonna exit, like in the closed economy. In contrast, if between phi D and phi X, if your productivity is between the productivity, domestic productivity cutoff and the export cutoff, you only sell domestically. Since we assume that phi X is greater than phi D, if your productivity is higher than phi x, then you're gonna sell domestically and you're gonna export. So why are we assuming that this export cutoff is higher than the domestic cutoff? We're assuming that because we saw in the data that exporters were the largest firms, were the most productive firms, were the firms with the higher value added per worker. And this is what we have here. What we have is the most productive firms, which have the largest sales, the largest profits will export. The least productive firms will exit and the firms that are somewhere in between will just sell domestically, okay? Now the main question is, okay, is phi D different from phi A? In other words, when our home economy starts trading, does the domestic cutoff changes? And if it does, how does it change? Well, to figure that out, uh, we need to study again, the zero expected profit condition. So let's do that. So as in the closed economy model, the expected profits must equal the fixed cost of entry. So the expected profits are the integral of your, you know, every, your, your profits your domestic profits from phi D, the domestic cutoff to infinity, there should be a phi uh, as an argument for the profits there, plus your expected profits from exporting. So the integral of your profits of exporting from phi X to infinity. So if we substitute profits into this equation, recall that profits are given by these two equations here, what we obtain is this long expression Okay, which we're going to simplify by recalling that uh, these integrals 
we define it as a J function. So what we have is FD times J of phi D plus FX J of phi X equals the fixed cost. Beautiful. So this is the fix, the free entry condition. You can imagine that using our cutoff condition here, substituting phi X for phi D, this equation will pin down the domestic cutoff. And that will trickle down onto all the variables. But so is phi D larger or smaller or equal to phi A? Well, let's see. This is the main result of the, of the Melitz model. So we just saw that free entry under international trade is given by this equation. Here we have FD, J of phi D plus fx j of phi x equals the fixed cost of entry. What was the free entry condition under other key? It's this. It was ft j of phi a equals the fixed cost of entry. So I guess you see where I'm going with this. And since the right hand side is the same in both cases, and above we have fd j of phi d, and so the same expression, so to speak, of what's below, plus something, well, that means that j of phi d is smaller than j of phi a. But we saw that this means that phi a is less than phi d. Recall that j of phi a, that is proportional to the expected profits. And if your cutoff increases, that means it's more likely to make zero profits so that j function declines. So J is declining in phi A. If J of phi A is greater than J of phi D, that means that the cutoff A, the domestic cutoff under other key is smaller than the domestic cutoff under trade. So this means that we saw before from zero to phi D from the exit, from phi D to phi X from only sell domestically, phi x and beyond from the export. Phi a used to be here. So there were a bunch of firms that were producing domestically before international trade and they now exit. Okay, so what is happening here? Well, what's happening is that international trade forces the least productive firms to exit. They die. Is this good or bad? Well, that's actually a good thing. We saw last time that higher cutoff is associated with lower price index. And a lower price index means better welfare, right? Higher utility. That is because if the cutoff is higher, only the most productive firms produce. Average price decline, so you can consume more of whatever goods are available. And so what is happening here? Well, that means that we trade the price index PD declines. Okay? It's less than the other key price index. And so welfare improves. And so what this is saying is that trade forces out the least productive firms. Okay? This causes the reallocation of production towards the most productive firms. Average productivity increases the utility, the average welfare, the welfare in the economy increases because higher productivity is associated with lower prices, right? Beautiful. So we've basically seen a model whereby international trade can actually improve productivity because it has the dynamic effect that we saw at the very beginning of last time's presentation, right? So this is very important. Now you may wonder, what is driving this reallocation of production effect? Uh, you may think that it's perhaps competition in final goods markets. So you start trading, you know, Denmark starts trading with uh, Sweden. There is increased competition and that causes the least efficient Danish firms and Swedish firms to exit. Well, that is fine. It's intuitive, but that, not that is not exactly what's happening here because recall here we have constant markups. So there's really no... No, no role for competition there. What is happening is that as you know, you start trading more, exporters start exporting. 
they produce more. Uh, how can they produce more? Well, they need workers. Okay. Where are the workers coming from? Well, they can only come from other firms within the economy. And so what is a way, a way to think about it is that if you want to produce more, uh, you want to hire more workers, so you want to increase the wages. And if you increase the wages, only the most productive firms can actually afford those wages and they drive out the least efficient firms. Okay. Excellent. So let's summarize the main takeaways of the Melitz model. Uh, the main takeaway is that there is a selection of firms. Okay. So this is sort of, we hinted at it in the Krugman 79 model, but here we have it in its most uh, glorified way. There's two selections here. First, there is a selection of firms into exporting. Right, so why is it that the, only the most productive firms can export? Because they're productive enough to pay the iceberg trade cost and the fixed export cost. There is also a selection into domestic production. Only the most productive firms can produce and pay the fixed cost of production and can survive in the market. What is happening is that trade that makes selection in domestic market tougher. And when a country starts trading, what happens is that um, the least efficient firms in that economy exit because they're no longer able to generate enough revenue to pay up their variable and fixed cost of production. And we saw that this is a good thing because average productivity in the market increases. Okay, as I said, this model lends itself to several application in other, uh, in other frameworks, in other uh, fields. And you can think that really what matters here is these cutoffs, okay? Because the cutoffs determine the selection of firms, individual students into various possible outcomes and changes in the cutoffs will affect this selection. And if you wanna study changes in policy, uh, the effects of changes in policy on welfare in the presence of heterogeneous agents, oftentimes what it boils down to do is to study what happens to the selection, okay? Excellent. And now here's some bonus content for you with some MATLAB simulation so that I can actually show you that all the things that we've been doing actually works great in the data. In this uh, little exercise on MATLAB, I really want to show you uh, how the Melitz model performs uh, in the data. So when I say that it's actually quite successful, and I also think that looking at the uh, same model and in particular, uh, distribution of sales and how to bring the model to the computer can actually help you understand even, even more this particular model. So for this exercise, I'm going to use uh, uh, data from Chile, which is a country that makes available to anybody really, a lot of information at the firm level. If you look at the Chilean uh, uh, website uh, for its uh, statistical agency, you can download uh, sales uh, of firms in manufacturing. Uh, you can also download information about their uh, employment, you know, whether they're hiring low skilled workers or high skilled workers and so on. Actually, there's a few students that use the Chilean data for their thesis. So let's look at the data first. So the data gives us uh, the sales and we can look at the distribution of the sales. And for instance, in this figure, uh, what we have uh, is uh, something that's similar to a CDF in a way. It would be a CDF for the sales if you had flip it. So if the horizontal axis was the vertical one, because on the vertical, on the vertical axis, you have the log sales of Chilean firms. And here you have the percentiles. You see basically the 99 percentile of distribution as a log sales of well, above 18, so maybe almost 19. And the log sales of the bottom is uh, uh, around 11. Okay. 
So in logs, you can think that this is increasing linearly and then it increases much faster for the largest firms. And so that's a convenient way of uh, uh, visualizing the distribution of sales. However, it's something that perhaps we are more uh, accustomed to is the histogram, so the PDF. And here I'm drawing the PDF, uh, reducing uh, the sample to firms that uh, do not have sales too large, because otherwise it would be very difficult to see what is going on in the picture. But as you can see in this figure, uh, this is for sales, not for log sales. And you can see that for sales, the distribution really looks like a Pareto distribution because you have the highest mass of points at the lowest sales. And then the, the frequency, the number of firms that have larger and larger sales uh, uh, declines uh, very rapidly. Now, now what we wanna do is uh, apply our simple Melitz model and see how well it can match the distribution of firms that I showed you before. To do that, we basically need to compute the revenues of uh, the Melitz model across firms. But to do that, we need uh, some values for the productivity of all firms. And in particular, we need to make some assumption over the distribution capital G, which is what we uh, take, took as given in class well, in the video recording. Then we're gonna make an assumption that the productivity is Pareto distributed. I showed you uh, above that this means that the CDF, G of phi, is one minus B over phi to the power of theta. Okay. Uh, if you're interested, you're welcome to read this section on how to actually simulate the uh, distribution of firms. So what we're going to do is draw the productivity for uh, 10,000 firms and then using different values for the theta parameter, we're going to look at theta equals 3, theta equals 4, and theta equals 5. And uh, well, let's see what the productivity distribution looks like. So you can see here what the productivity distribution looks like for different values of theta. Okay, so this kind of looks like the sales distribution, doesn't it? Because we have that uh, the largest mass of firms is at the lowest possible productivity. And then as you, you know, the frequency with, of, with, of firms with higher and higher productivity uh, decreases actually quite rapidly, okay? And the Pareto distribution has several interesting properties, uh, but we're not gonna talk about them in this video. But so uh, you can see here the different values of theta are basically generating a, a different mass of firms uh, at higher levels of productivity. You see the lower the theta, the larger the mass of firms that have higher levels of productivity and lower vice versa that have low productivity. Okay, but so with these three different um, uh, draws of uh, productivity, phi one, phi two, and phi three, uh, what, do the sale, what does the sale distribution looks like? Well, you see that basically our uh, model does fairly well in sort of capturing the overall shape of the sales distribution. You see that with theta equals three, we get very close to it. Right? And then with theta equals four, we get a little farther away. Theta equals five, we get even further. And obviously we have some problems down here, right? but we'll, I, I'll come back to that. But so what the objective is now, this is something that's uh, referred to as calibration or model estimation. We basically want to find the value of theta such that our distribution of uh, sales predicted by the model is as close as possible to the one in the data. And so this is something that is uh, 
I guess, pretty cool. I mean, the first time I, I saw this doing, I thought, okay, this is very interesting. So let's see, this is the code. You don't have to worry too much about the code. Basically, if we run this code, we're basically uh, minimizing the difference between the two distributions. Look at that, our code converges. We have found the local minimum and we have a theta of 2.8. Notice that I've assumed a sigma of six. We cannot separately match these two with just uh, this distribution, but don't worry too much about that. What matters is that then we can draw our productivity distribution, compute the sales, which are the productivity to the power of sigma minus one for each firm with productivity phi. We take the log of sales, which is this sales plus a constant that we have estimated, and then we can plot our distribution. And there you go. You can see that we do a pretty good job in matching the distribution of sales in the data. Okay. Now, let's take a second to appreciate this. We have uh, uh, in the data about uh, 5,308 firms, okay? In order to do a pretty good job to match the distribution of their sales with their Melitz model, we really only need one parameter, the parameter theta, okay? So this is a very parsimonious way of matching the data, which speaks favorably of the Melitz model, of how good that model is. Now you can see here that we do a very good job in matching the distribution from the 20th percentile up until the 100th percentile, okay? Now maybe there's a few uh, points in which we're farther away from the distribution, but overall we do a very good job. We don't do a good job when it comes to the smallest firms, okay? Because here you can see that in the model, the blue line, the distribution goes down almost as a straight line, whereas, uh, so you can imagine here that basically the, uh, as you go move down the productivity distribution, uh, the sales are declining at a sort of constant rate, whereas in the data, it declines at a faster rate. Now to match that, unfortunately, we cannot do that with the merits model, we need different models that allow for these uh, small firms to exist. After all, in our model, the smallest firm has to be able to pay the fixed cost, which is the same for everybody. So only if you tinker with that assumption, perhaps you allow the fixed cost to decline in the number of customers that you serve, or maybe you adopt other demand functions that do not require a fixed cost, to um, pin down the productivity cutoff, as you will see in the homework, well, then you can match this particular uh, side of the distribution. But overall, I would say the merits model does a pretty good job. That's it for today. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Ciao.